Um, you picked a great day to be in church. What a great series we're in, Uncomfortable Christianity. How many of you know that nothing grows in comfort? That it only grows when you get uncomfortable. And uh, I love this church, love your pastor and his wife and the whole family, and um, what an incredible leader. It was, uh, your pastor helped me get through my doctorate because, um, not because like helping me with my classwork, helped keep me awake in classes that were not entertaining. Um, you know, we had our laptops open like we were taking notes, we were really texting each other. Um, no, but an incredible, incredible leader. Just want you to know that what God is doing in your church is beyond your church. And you need to know that and how God is using your church. The, the big C church around the country is looking at you and learning from you. And, um, and don't let that get lost on you. A lot of times when you're in it every week, it can kind of get lost on you that this is a move of God. And God's not doing this everywhere. But for some reason, His grace and His favor has decided to rest on this place. And, uh, and great things don't happen like this without great leadership. How many of you know that? So can you thank God? Come on for your pastors. Thank God for Katie. We love you and honor you. What a gift. I was uh, up, up by Aaron's office. There's a plaque. I'd never seen it before. And it was an article. And uh, it was you. And you only had one child. And Aaron wasn't doing CrossFit at the time. It looked so young. I was like, what it, this is the dream. Hey, here, here's what I want you to remember sometimes. This is just free. This isn't my message. Don't ever complain when you're walking in the answer of the prayer you prayed. Yes. When you have to get up at three and feed that baby and you're half tired, remember, you're walking in the answer to the prayer. Whenever the business grows and you're like, all these staff, they're driving me crazy. No, no, no. That was the dream. And you're walking in the answered prayer. So can I just encourage you um, from, from a pastor's heart and somebody that loves your church is, uh, is when you walk up and, and the kids check in line is so long, just to go, thank God we're walking in the answered prayer. Yes. When it's so hard to get out of the parking lot and you're like, I got to get to lunch, just stop and go. No, we're walking in the middle of answered prayer. When they go, we need to open another campus, need you to give another $3 million, be like, aren't we done yet? No, we're walking in the middle of answered prayer. Come on, how many of you are thankful for everything God's doing in your church? Hey, let's pray together. Father, we love you. We open our hearts and minds to you, and we ask your word to speak to us. We know it will. May we never be the same because of it. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Amen. If you're in the note-taking type, I want to bring a message entitled, Work It Out. Work It Out. Um, I, we have four kids, my wife Tammy and I. have been married 20 years in June this summer. Excited about that. And um, we have four children, all the way from 17 to 5 years old. So 17, 14, um, took a break, same wife. <laughs> Just want to make sure that's clear. And... Uh, then we have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. The five-year-old we adopted, he came to us at five days old, and uh, he, he's a whole vibe. He'll be in Kids Point, or Kids Church, we call it Kids Point, in the 11 o'clock. So I just said a special prayer. Come on, let's thank God for all of our kids volunteers, everybody serving, and, and kids. You'll have two of mine, so God bless you. Um, because when, they're, when, when you're in your late 40s and you have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, you don't care anymore. And so the 17 and 14 year old, they're like, they get by with everything. I'm like, I have no energy for them. <laughs> like, I have no energy to be like, stop it. You know, I don't care anymore. Um, you two, I had energy and I could be like, you know, don't do that. That's not nice. And I'm just like, go to your room. You got your iPad? Um, come on. Thank God for iPad parenting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but how many of you, when you maybe experienced this as a child or you say this if you're a parent now. You ever say to your kids, they're getting in some kind of conflict or spat, and you're like, hey, you two need to work it out, yeah. right? You just need to work it out. Now, let's be honest, parents, sometimes we just don't want to deal with it. So we're like, can you please go work that out? But also, we know that if they don't learn to work out conflict among themselves, if they don't gain those tools, then they're going to have a hard time later in life. If you're with me, say amen. So what we're actually trying to do is go, no, there's some skill sets, and there's some 
some competencies that you're going to need later in life. And if I don't teach you and train you now to work it out, I can't rescue you in every situation. You know, our kids now in high school, it's a lot of our parenting's transitioned to a lot of coaching and a lot of conversations and a lot of, hey, can you talk to my teacher? And I'm like, no, 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 because I won't talk to your boss one day. You're going to talk to your teacher now. You're going to learn to go work this thing out. Somebody shout, work it out. Work it out. And I want to propose to you that in this series, we're in uncomfortable Christianity, that a lot of times God will allow seasons in your life where you have to work out your faith in order to grow your faith. That there are some things that you're going to need in life. How many of you know that God sees your beginning from your end? Yes. That God is not confined by time, but God is outside of time. So God saw the day you were born and the day you'll die at the same time. Because he doesn't see on a linear scale. He is outside of time. And because that, he knows every day of your life. And he knows what you're going to need in the season ahead. So in the season previous, he will allow you to work things out. Why? To put some new tools in your belt so you are ready for what is to come. If you're tracking so far, say amen. amen. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a season in your life where you don't have the answer or you can't find the solution or it doesn't matter how much money you have or, or your network or your net worth, there is nothing that you can do to resolve the issues that you are facing. And I would propose that that isn't God doing something to you, but it is God wanting to do something through you to grow your faith. Because God is in the business, listen to me church, God is in the business of growing your faith and faith doesn't grow in the confines of comfort. It grows in the uncomfortable places. Maybe we could even go forward and say it grows in the painful places. It grows in the places where we don't understand where God is and we don't understand what God is doing. And if we're gut level honest, we've all been in those places in our life and maybe you're walking through one right now that you, don't, you can't see God, you don't feel God, you don't hear God. And the problem is this, is that we assume that if God is good, life should be easy. But God is good and life is not always easy. But God is always working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In other words, God is able to cook up a great meal with your life, but the recipe is often pain and blessing. Mountaintops and valley moments. And God is able to mix all those things together so that he can work it towards good in your life, although it may not be good. He didn't say everything in life would be good. He said everything in life he would work for your good. In other words, God has a way of leveraging the painful moments in your life for your benefit if you will cooperate with him. And now that is up to you. You and I have the, the desire or, or we have the, the decision to make of whether or not we cooperate with God in the middle of pain or if in the middle of pain and uncomfortable times in our life, we back up and get bitter and get angry and go, where is God? Or we get, lean in and go, God, what are you doing right now? Yeah. I want to propose God is always in the business of growing your faith. And all of us have faith. Romans 12 teaches us we all have a measure of faith. And some of our measure may feel like, well, mine is just a little ounce. <laughs> That's all I got. Or God measured me a cup of faith. And it doesn't matter regardless how big or small you think your faith is. God has measured all of us some faith. And he's in the business of growing our faith and stretching our faith. And just like a muscle in the gym, from what I've heard, <laughs> grows best under pressure. God grows you best under pressure. And so what is faith? Well, Hebrews says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it's evidence. It's evidence. Y'all were awful quiet. <laughs> Very timid with your conversation. So let's track on this. If you're with me, say amen. amen. I, want, I, want to, I want us to dive into this for a moment and get this, and then I'm going to give you three perspective changes you have to make on faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith isn't a feeling. It's, the faith isn't the feeling when, when the band turns on the bridge of the song and you, know, and, and you get goosebumps. That's not faith. Faith isn't an emotion. It may produce an emotion, but it's not an emotion. Faith is evidence. 
So faith is tangible, visible, observable stuff. I'm no lawyer, but I do know that in a court of law, you have to bring evidence. You can't come to the judge and say, well, judge, I just kind of feel like they were going to kill me. No, someone can't be uh, committed for, uh, you know, convicted of attempted murder because you felt like something. There has to be evidence that is permitted. And so in the, ev- in the court of the kingdom of God, for there to be faith, there has to be evidence. Let me give you a very practical example. All of you exercised faith today whenever they said be seated. You made the assumption that the church was responsible enough to get chairs that met code that would hold the weight of your body if you sat down. I don't think that anybody at any campus went like, all right, we're going to go for it. (laughs) Had a few couple pieces of pizza too many this week. This may be the week. We'll go slow. No, we all just sat down. Why? Because we had faith the chair would hold us, and the evidence was we sat right down. Are you tracking with me? And so my faith isn't a feeling. My faith is tangible evidence. My faith does this. My faith acts in spite of evidence that I can see. In other words, I go on what God has said, not what I can see. So I may be in the middle of a situation that is is plaguing me with fear, but faith goes, no, I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so I'm going to have peace in the middle of this chaos around me. That is the evidence I have. So that when I walk up into work and people go, I know you're walking through hell, but you seem to have joy in your heart. I don't understand understand it. It's evidence of my faith. Come on, if you're with me, put your hands together. And God wants to grow that faith. He wants there to be more and more evidence in your life the more and more days you are alive. And the faith will grow in uncomfortable places. So I want to talk to you about a lady in the Bible today by the name of Hannah who had her faith grow in a very uncomfortable situation. And I want to give you three perspective shifts or changes because how you see a thing is how you will interpret a thing and that determines how you live something. And if the lens of your life are foggy, your whole life is going to be foggy. So I want to give you three ways to see it in a different way that I think will be helpful today. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you have the Bible with you, if you're not, we'll... Um, have it on the screen for you, and um, we'll read along. Beginning in verse 2, the Bible said he had two wives, and Pastor Aaron's going to unpack that next week. <laughs> I didn't come preach the difficult things. This God named Elkanah, he had two wives, and they were named Hannah and the other one, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had none. So year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. So he went up to the temple at a certain time every year to sacrifice before the Lord and worship. Where Hophnius and Phinehas, not Phinehas and Ferb, (laughs) Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Penina, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. She could have no children. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. How many of you know you can handle something for a minute, but year after year? And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and she would not eat. I know y'all better y'all about y'all, but I got to be pretty distressed not to eat. So here's the picture: is that Hannah um, is desiring to have a child and can't have a child, and not only that, but she has this sister wife thing happening. <laughs> TLC's got them on a show, and and she's provoking and irritating her to the point that she is weeping and she can't even eat. I don't know about you, but I found myself at times in life where where I'm so distraught by something, I have no other option but to turn to the Lord. 
I don't know if you've ever said this. I've said this as a pastor. It's not my proudest moment. I'm like, well, I've done everything else I can. I guess we pray now. But maybe prayer should have been where I started. Are you tracking with me? But I've done all of that I know to do. How many of you know you, if you haven't, you're going to face things in life that, that you can't solve on your own? And there will be a gap in your life, or let me say a deficit in your life, between where you are and where what you are desiring or believing for is. And I want to propose to you today the first shift that you have to make or the first change in your perspective you have to make is this, is that the deficit is faith's opportunity. A lot of times when there's a gap in our life or a deficit, a gap between this is where my marriage is and this is where I'm believing for God to heal it and to be, or, or this is where my children are and this is where I'm believing for God to bring them, or, or whatever, whatever, I don't know, you could fill in the blank with your own thing that you can't solve, maybe financial, it may be physical, it may be an addiction, I don't know, it may be a breakthrough in your company, I don't know what it is, but we all have those gaps in our life between where we are and between what we're believing for God to do, and in the gap we get the choice to see it as God doing something to us, that God is trying to get us, that God is trying to defeat us, or we get to see it as an opportunity where God is trying to grow us. And I would propose today that the gap in your life isn't God trying to beat you down, but it is God creating an opportunity. I'm not saying he sends bad things in your life. I'm just saying God works all things together for good in your life. And if you will allow him and cooperate with him, he will use the gap in your life as an opportunity for your faith to grow. And I just would propose to you that maybe you shouldn't waste painful moments in your life and just sit around and go, well, what is God doing to me? And get bitter and angry, but go, no, no, no. If the devil's going to come at me, he's going to be sorry he did because I'm going to grow faith in my life to a higher level. I'm going to know Jesus more. I'm going to love him deeper. I'm going to have greater faith coming on the other side of this than I did coming into this. Whenever our second child was born, her name is Faith, and she is all things cheerleading. Go Eagles, pom-poms, bows. I'm here for it. I'm a cheer dad. I got a t-shirt that says Faith's dad. It's on the back. Pom-poms on the front. Competitions. Oh, Lord, Competitions. Cheer mom, parent, drama, wow. We had a set down at the beginning of the year. We were like, baby girl, we ain't getting involved in the drama. Our family doesn't do that. We will go, we'll support, we're there. No drama. Yes, sir, dad, I got you. I was like, good. So whenever uh, Tammy was pregnant, her, this was you know, our second child. On the first child, you know, everything is new, right? I mean, the ultrasound's new and the... You hear the the little baby heartbeat, all that's new, right? You know, you're sterilizing pacifiers. I can just tell you, with one four, by, by child three and four, you're wiping it on your leg and giving it. So all you first-time parents, keep sterilizing. You have three. By four, you may leave them at church. I'm not saying this happened to us theoretically. That I called my wife on the way home and go, do you have Jonas? No, do you? No, I'll turn around. <laughs> He's still in the nursery. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Great parenting. That's why I'm here not preaching on parenting, everybody. We're preaching on faith. So we do the first ultrasound, then we get a call, and they're like, hey, you need to come back. We need to do a more in-depth ultrasound. We found some concerning things. How many of you know that those kind of calls and those kind of moments, I don't know how to experience it, experience express it, but like this wave of anxiousness comes over you. And so we go, and what we found out is they found spots on her brain, and they wanted to see, they wanted to do more in-depth ultrasound and to see what kind of uh, steps of action we needed to possibly take. And, um, and so we went back for the second ultrasound, and and they said, you know, we can do some invasive things, and we chose not to do that. And, and I wish I could say that in that room, I was like, I'm a man of faith, and God's going to heal this child. Um, but honestly, I was a man of fear of all the things. I don't know if you're like me, but I go to all the negative things. Like, I went to all the, the worst case scenarios in my mind. When we got home, something flipped on the inside of me, and I just determined 
Every night when Tammy falls asleep, I'm gonna lay my hand on her belly. And not because I'm a pastor. I wasn't a pastor at that point. I was pastoring a church, but not, I was just a dad. I was a follower of Jesus that had a gap in my life, a deficit. And I could either just complain, I could either shake my fist at God, or I could determine, no, God, you're going to do something out of this that's going to be miraculous. So every night I laid my hand on her belly and I just declared healing over her brain. I told those spots, get off it. (laughs) Not today, devil. Not in this house, not at this moment. This child's covered. And I just prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I believed and I believed. And she came out wonderful and healthy and with a mouth and it goes. (laughs) And now that she's a teenager's eyes that roll and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank God for answering my prayer. I'm living the dream, right? I'm living the dream. I have to remind myself I'm living the dream, right? But here's what I want you to know. I learned to pray in a way. I knew how to pray, but I learned to pray in a way I'd never prayed before whenever that deficit was in my life. And I learned to lean into God in a way that I never leaned in before. I wouldn't have developed that kind of faith. And I wouldn't have developed that muscle of faith if I had not walked through the deficit in my life. And I'm not saying that God did that, but I'm saying God used that to grow something on the inside of me that was not there before. And I now have an empathy for people and can pray for others in a way that I never prayed for them before because I walk through something like that. I'm just saying, don't waste the deficit in your life. It is not God doing something to get you. It is God giving you an opportunity to grow a muscle of faith that you may need down the road if you will embrace the moment. Let me say it this way. It's God answers your prayers within the prayer. There's always prayers within your prayer. Let me give you an example. God, I want you to use me. God, I want you to do something great in my life. God, I want you to grow me. This is my year of growth. My word for the year is grow. I want to grow. (laughs) Be careful. The word for my year is health. Be careful. Because to get healthy, you got to get nasty out. To grow, you got to be stretched. So we pray, God, grow me. God, use me. And God goes, okay, I'm going to do that. But in order to do that, I've got to develop some new things in you. And so to develop some new things in you, you may have to walk through some stretching. And then whenever the stretching starts, we come back Sundays later and we're in worship going, God, remove the struggle. God's like, time out. But two Sundays ago, you were going, God, use me. God, grow me. God's like, are you schizophrenic? (laughs) Now we're coming back and we're like, I rebuke the devil. He's coming out and God's like, no, no, no. I thought you wanted to be grown. I thought you wanted to be used. I thought this was the year of impact. Well, in order to do that, I know what's coming down the rest of your year. So I got to build some things into you. And so the deficit is the opportunity to grow. You got to put on new lens. The Bible goes on to say that um, Hannah goes to the the temple and she's praying. And as she's praying, it says she kept on praying to the Lord and Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. I wonder if you've been at such a place of anguish that she physiologically couldn't even get words out. And Eli thought she was drunk. And said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine nor beer. I'm not high class and I'm not redneck. (laughs) I'm kidding. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went on her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. If the the deficit in our, our life is the opportunity for faith to grow, then the word is faith's foundation. The word of God, a word from God, is the foundation that we build our faith on. I want you to notice that 
that Hannah got a word from the prophet and immediately, physiologically, she changed. She was no longer crying, she was no longer downcast, and she was hungry. How many of you know that whenever you're so overwhelmed, sometimes food is the last thing you want to put in your body? So physiological change took place at the moment she received a word. I want to unpack that for a second. Because whenever, if you're new to church and we say things like, God gave me a word, some of you may be like, was that like will of fortune? Was that like <laughs> two consonants, one vowel? Or, hey, Pat, give me a spin. Like, what, what, what does that mean, a word? Did God give you like animal? <laughs> there's your word. Or what, what does that mean? Well, there's two. The, the, in the Greek, the New Testament written in the, the word logos means word. Um, like the word, speaking of Jesus. But then there's a rhema word, which is a word within a word. Follow me on this. It, it's, it's rhema word that you get when Pastor Aaron is preaching the word of God every week, and, and there's a thousand different people receiving it in a di- thousand different ways. The Holy Spirit does that. It's the word within a word. So he's preaching the word, and you walk away going, one little section of it, you go, I needed to hear that today. That was for me. What is that? That's the rhema word. That's the word that is in season. It's the word that you needed at the moment. It's, it's the word that is within the word. If you're tracking, say amen. amen. And so Hannah got a word that was in season. May the Lord God of Israel grant you what you've requested from the prophet of God. And immediately it changed her. Why? Because she came, may I find favor with this. She came into agreement with the word. This is critically important. For your faith to come alive and to grow, you have to come into agreement with the word of God. So many of us are in agreement with a lot of other things, but we're not in agreement with the word of God. In other words, a lot of us, we're in agreement with the lies of the enemy. We're in agreement with the lies that people have spoken over us. I'll never amount to nothing. I can't become anything. No one will ever love me. We're in agreement with all these other negative words in our life. And I would say that you need to shift your faith into coming into agreement with the word of God and in agreement with the rhema word that God gives in that moment. And it was that word that changed Hannah in a second, like physiologically changed. She came in agreement with the word of God because the word of God is where we put our footing on and is the foundation of this faith that God is wanting to grow in us. We can't put our footing in our how we feel because our feelings come and go. We can't put our footing and our our foundation into what is culturally relevant or culturally acceptable at the time because it is ever-changing and it is rapidly changing. But the word of God remains forever. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word remains forever. It is the word of God that will not return void. It will accomplish what has been set out to do. So in other words, when you get a word from God, it's not to give you a cute feeling. Oh, that's encouraging. No, when you get a word from God, it is God informing you of what is about to take place in your life. And I don't know if it'll be a year from now or a week from now or a month from now, but if God says it, you can take it to the bank that it is going to come to pass. And so that is what you anchor your faith to. So many of us get so disappointed because we've anchored our faith to things other than the word of God. We anchored our faith to a feeling then it didn't happen and we got disappointed. We anchored our faith to what somebody said to us, and it didn't come to pass the way that they said it would come to pass. We anchored our faith to somebody's promise instead of anchoring it to the word of God that never fails. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. So you got to anchor your faith to the word. The word is faith foundation. Hannah got a word, and immediately it changed everything. Immediately she got up. Listen to me, y'all, real practically. She didn't get up pregnant. Y'all tracking? It's not like she stood up and was pregnant. But she left, no longer downcast, and worshiping, and ready to eat. So Hannah was worshiping based on the word, not on the pregnancy. That's faith. 
Faith says, I'm going to worship on the word. I may be feeling fear right now, but I haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The doctor may have said it was cancer, but I serve the God who heals all of my diseases so I can come into worship. I can come in with tears coming down my face going, I trust in God because he hears and he answers. Why? Because I have a word. I didn't need the spots on the brain to be gone. I had a word. I wasn't waiting to worship until the doctor gave me the good report. I was worshiping before I got the good report because I had, I had a word. Are you tracking with me? The word is faith's foundation. So what happens? Well, they go home, they get busy, acting on faith, <laughs> on the word. And what happens? She has a baby. She's nursing that baby. She skips a year at the temple. She weans Samuel off. And then she goes to the temple again. And verse 26 said, and she said to him, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying. I'm the one you thought was drunk. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord and he will worship the Lord there. Number three, last thought, is sacrifice is faith's test. The test of Hannah's faith wasn't could she pray and believe for a child. Watch this. The test of Hannah's faith is once God answered the prayer and it was in her hands, could she keep open hands? And here's the thing about how God works, is you came into this earth with nothing in your hands. You came empty-handed, every one of us. And anything that is in your hands, God put it there. And that was a blessing. And what can stunt our growth in faith is when we're unwilling to give the blessing of God back to him so we can receive greater blessing. See, we're human nature, and human nature, what happens is when God blesses us, we go, got it. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to keep it. And God goes, I can't bless clenched fist, but I can bless open hands. See, Hannah and Samuel wasn't just about Hannah and Samuel. Hannah praying for a baby and having Samuel wasn't about her having a baby. It was about God blessing a nation. It was Samuel that would become a prophet. It was Samuel that would anoint the king of Israel. It was Samuel that would confront the kings of Israel. And Hannah thought it was just about her and her little world and just wanting to have a little baby and just wanting a little baby boy to, to love on and cherish. But God was doing something so much bigger in the scheme of plans and God was wanting to bless a nation. And her returning Samuel back to the Lord wasn't just about her returning Samuel back to the Lord. According to history, Hannah would have five more children. God wasn't just giving her a baby. God was opening her womb. God was doing so much, something so much larger that Hannah couldn't see in the moment. You couldn't see till hindsight, and that's the thing about faith. Often, we don't see till hindsight all the things that God is doing, and I would just want to propose to you, if you have a gap in your life or a deficit in your life, and God is trying to get you to work it out, to build a greater muscle, it's not just about what is happening to you right now. You can't see it, and we don't know it, but God is always up to something bigger, and God is always up to something greater, and the battle you're facing could be about the next generation. You fighting for your marriage could be about changing a generational curse and developing something for generations to come and you breaking through that area of your life could be something about your children's children and so are you willing in the deficit to go no God this is an opportunity for you to work something great in me that God I'm going to anchor my life to your word and no matter what you put in my hands I'm going to live open handed can I tell you for each of you individually the test of your faith isn't 
Can you believe for great things? The test of your faith is when God gives you the answer, can you live open-handed? When you're living the dream, can you give God the dream back? As a church family, God's blessed. God's doing amazing things. The test of your faith isn't, can God answer your prayer? The test of your faith is, are you still willing to sacrifice after God's blessed so much? Because it's in that place that your faith truly grows. It's in that place that you truly, as Paul said, work out your faith with fear and trembling. Will you pray with me at every campus, every head bowed, every eye closed? For some of you today, you need to take the step of faith into relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never taken that step. Maybe you've never begun a relationship with him. And today he wants to give you a brand new beginning. The Bible says that we've all sinned. That's not meant to condemn anybody. It's the reality of the human condition. And we've all fall short. And that's why Jesus came. He came to live the life you could never live perfect. Die the death that we all deserved. And if you'll simply place your faith in him, you can have a brand new beginning today. So if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, at any campus, even online, I need a fresh start today. I need a new beginning in Christ. That's me. Then in just a moment, we're going to pray together. And with no one looking around, we wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But if you say that's me, then when I count to three, I just want you to shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for us to see. No one looking around, just myself, your campus pastor. On three, you shoot it up at all over the church. One, two, three. Say, that's me. I need a new beginning. I need a fresh start. God bless you all over the room. You can put it down. Church, let's pray this out loud together for the benefit of those who just slipped their hand up. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. Thank you for a brand new beginning. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision. Well, thank you so much for watching Radiant Church YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to this channel right now. You can click the button so you don't miss anything. You can support the ministry by sharing this message with a friend or by clicking the Give Now button that you see on your screen so that we can continue to see lives changed for Jesus. Thanks for watching. The best is yet to come.